Good morning, class. Hope everyone is healthy and well. So this video should hopefully help to explain the second short assignment paper, the short response paper, which is due in two days, and is going to be on William James's variety of religious experiences. There's uh, two questions, and you're only to select one. Let me go ahead and read the first question, and um, then I'll discuss some of the components to it, some of the things you should address if you uh, decide to do this question, and then we'll do the same thing for the uh, second question. So the first question particularly uh, revolves around the uh, second chapter of the Varieties of Re Religious Experience, which is uh, circumscription of the topic. I'll go ahead and read the question. So in the Varieties of Religious Experience, uh, William James provides a broad and, arbitrary, and admittedly arbitrary definition of religion. Please explain what his definition of religion is, as well as how his ideas of first-hand and second-hand um, religious experience factors into his focus on religious experience. What justification does he provide for his definition of religion, and do you find such justification is warranted? How does James un James's understanding of mysticism relate to his focus when examining the varieties of religious experience. So let's uh, let's break this down first. In, in the circumscription of the topic, he begins to uh, focus what his uh, second lecture will be about. Uh, there's many different approaches to religious experience, and he is focusing on the uh, psychological and his um, sort of epistemology is also pragmatism, but he just doesn't say I'm focusing on the psychological because I happen to be a psychologist. He, he expresses um, justification for this, and this is one of the things you should uh, focus in if you decide to answer this question. So he separates religion into the uh, personal and the institutional, and he's just going to focus on the personal, but he has a, a justification for that that being the difference between first-hand and uh, second-hand religious experience. And so be sure to address this. In, in brief, first-hand religious experience is direct religious experience, which a person experiences. Uh, we have the example, say, uh, Muhammad's um, encounter with the uh, angel Gabriel. We have uh, Moses' encounter on Sinai with, uh, with the divine. So these are direct uh, uh, first-hand religious experiences. After both of these encounters, for example, the individuals that had these encounters will tell others about it, and then others will say something like, ah, I also believe that to be true, and they will adopt this uh, this religious perspective, and they too will, will have this uh, religious belief. Uh, but it's a second-hand religious experience that the latter has. They themselves did not directly experience that experience, but they um, they got it from another. We use the word second-hand a lot when, when thinking of like a second-hand store, probably more so with second-hand smoke. It's not originally yours. It was from someone else, but then it um, you happen to experience it, but not directly or immediately you experience through the other person's um, experience. And so William James decides to focus on the first-hand religious experience. And he does so because he finds that uh, from the first-hand religious experience, um, the, the second-hand comes into being. And the second-hand is what sort of perpetu uh, perpetuates the institutional aspect of religion. And so the institutional aspect of religion, uh, James argues, has its origin in the, uh, in the personal aspect of religion. Other aspects to address in this question, how does it have to do with mysticism? Well, mysticism is a very powerful form of firsthand religious experience. And so he gives four um, characteristics of mysticism. Two are um, essential and two are often just there present. The two essential are the ineffable quality of it. Ineffable meaning it cannot fully be put into words. 
uh, the experience is, is more than the words that can describe the experience. And also the noetic qualities. Although it can't fully be put into words, an individual did receive much information in the experience. And, and so these are the two characteristics of the mysticism. There's also a, a transitoriness, meaning that it will only happen briefly. The effects may be uh, may last a lifetime, but the actual experience is brief and the passivity, it happens to someone, they don't cause it. So these are the four qualities of, of mysticism. And so he's going to be looking at the uh, most um, uh, profound, most um, um, intense forms of firsthand religious experience in these varieties of religious experiences. That's going to be his focus, but he hasn't defined religion yet. And, and this is part of the, the question. Uh, so in the circumscription of the topic, he will look through a variety of, of um, different definitions of religion. His definitions continue to change and evolve. So he will use the word divine, and then he will find that unsatisfactory for particular reasons that, that you may want to uh, describe. Then he'll go to godlike, and he'll also find that dissatisfactory for uh, for other reasons. And and then he will utilize the um, phrase a total reaction upon life. So so he thinks for uh, a brief time that religion can be defined as a person's total reaction upon life. But he even finds that this is somewhat dissatisfactory given certain total reactions. Uh, upon life. Think, for example, of the criticism he has of Voltaire. He doesn't think Voltaire has a religious attitude. You may agree or disagree, but why, why does he think this? So these are some things to, um, to address in this question. Finally, he um, was also trained as a um, as medical doctor, and so he uses this as an analogy to try to find out uh, what religion is. And he says, when looking at, at uh, the purpose of an organ, we ask, what can that organ do that, that no other organ can do? And he says, well, might we ask a similar question about religion? And so he asks, what does religion do that nothing else can, right? And, and he provides an answer. And it, I think for this question, it would be helpful to also address that concept, right? Um, Ultimately, given these evolving definitions he has, going from divine to godlike to a total reaction upon life to a qualified total reaction upon life, as well as uh, what religion can do that, um, that uh, nothing else can do in, in quite the same way, what is James's definition of religion, and and how does this factor in with ideas of mysticism? And first and, and second hand religious experience. So these are some thoughts that I think are important to address in the first question. Let me proceed quickly to the uh, second question. I'll read it and, and then I'll um, address some things in it. So James explains that there are two different types of religious individuals, the uh, healthy minded individual and the sick soul. Please define what he means by each type of individual and give examples from, of each from multiple religious traditions. Do you find that James makes the suggestion that one of these two types may have a more thorough understanding of the human condition than the other? If so, explain which one is this is and why. If not, explain how James finds both types to have an equally thorough understanding of the human condition. So the, so the first important thing uh, to address in, in this question, I would say, is the uh, varieties of each type of, of uh, individual. So the healthy mindedness are, are those people, he sort of talks there, um, he, he gives a variety of different um, descriptions of them. One of my favorites is he says they're born with a bottle or two of champagne to their credit, which means they're just sort of born in a, a sort of a happy state of being the way we would if we drank a bottle or two of champagne. That's just how they're, they're they would naturally react to life. And he also says that they are both of a voluntary and an involuntary type, right? Involuntary um, 
perhaps the uh, the best example of the involuntary which he gives is Walt Whitman, who um, just does not see any evil or negative in the world according to reports. Right? And people were skeptical of this, but but um, but after observation, they concluded that no, he just doesn't see the evil. He doesn't say anything negative about people. Whether this is is true or not is is um, is somewhat uh, uncertain, but um, but this is the report. There's and then there's the voluntary form of healthy mindedness, and these are people who do excuse me, who do see evil and pain and suffering in the world, but um, sort of try to will not to see it or believe that when they see it, they see it incorrectly. Right. So these are people that do see these negative aspects in the world, but try to sort of overcome them. And there's a variety of ways they can overcome them, thinking they're illusory, for example, waking up and saying mantras uh, like youth, health, vitality, and thinking that maybe the inverses of those are really illusory. If they just had a proper understanding of the world, they would not experience those. And then probably the most extreme form of, um, of the um, healthy-minded individual is um, the mind cure, which he addresses. And that's sort of saying that any negative ills can be uh, changed by a changing of the mind if one thinks properly about it. And what properly means is it will vary from whichever philosophy uh, of mind cure you have. So these would be some uh, um, phenomena in the healthy mindedness to, to address and, and sort of outline, right? Uh, for the sixth soul, uh, the sixth soul has the uh, sort of the reverse um, reaction to life. And this he sort of divides into uh, three different types. We have the, uh, the vanity of things. Uh, this is seen articulated most by uh, examples of Tolstoy that, that James gives. We have the uh, sinfulness of the human being. And then we have sort of the fear of the universe. And so these are three sort of negative reactions to life, right? Um, with, the, uh, with the vanity of things, you just sort of adopt a, uh, a meaninglessness uh, to your demeanor with, with address when, when confronted with uh, uh, all forms of life, right? Tolstoy, uh, we'll use him as an example. Um, he was a very successful individual. And yet he he sort of for a time fell into what James describes as the uh, the sixth soul, sort of seeing a, a, a vanity or a uselessness, a meaninglessness to all of life. Um, then the example of John uh, Bunyan, who was stressing the uh, the sinfulness of the human being. So this would be a person who uh, who sort of has a morbidness, sees that their nature is sinful or fallen. Nothing they can do is is pleasing to uh, a divine or, or some type of cosmic principle. Now, now he um, sort of um, subscribed to the um, uh, theological understanding of the fall. So he saw himself in, in distinction from animals who were not displeasing to God. And so you, you see the excerpts in the variety of religious experience in which he was in which he was wishing he was an animal so he wouldn't have the sinful nature. So uh, the varieties of the sick soul uh, range from uh, uselessness, a vanity, a meaninglessness of, thin, of things, uh, sinful nature that everything you do is displeasing and nothing you can do is pleasing to the divine, and then a sort of a fear of the, uh, of the universe. And so both positions can be seen as perhaps extremes uh, of, uh, of uh, the human condition. Right, they 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 delineate some of the human condition, but they don't necessarily seem balanced when given the other psychological perspective. And the question asks: Does James think that one perspective uh, has a more thorough understanding of the human condition? Now, what what is the human condition? That that's a, that's an interesting question. I kind of took it as meaning the totality of of um, experience as opposed to experience experience correctly as opposed to experience experience incorrectly but you wouldn't necessarily have to take the question that way so for example if a person let's let's pretend 
uh, and it might be true, but let's just pretend that Walt Whitman never experienced evil or pain or suffering or anything like that. Is there something untrue about that experience? It, does he not have a thorough understanding of the human condition as a, um, given that it, it would definitely appear that, that evil and pain and suffering exist um, for, for many people, right? It may have not for him, um, but but uh, but this is part of the question. This is something to think about. And those people who are sort of in a, a perpetual state of suffering, such as um, described by varieties of the sixth soul, are they missing out by seeing everything as vanity or uselessness? So so both seem to be lacking something um, with regard to the uh, perspective of the other. But does James think that one has a more thorough understanding of the human condition? than the other. So if you think so, uh, explain which one and why. And if you think not, then explain how he thinks two very um, different perspectives uh, can have an equal, uh, equally thorough understanding of the human condition. Be sure to answer all aspects of the question, and regardless of which question you do, give examples from the text. You don't need to deviate from the particular text. Really, you would just want to stick to lecture two, which is circumscription of the topic for the first question. And um, if you're answering the second question, you could really just read the healthy mindedness section and the six soul section. And there's um, an abundance of examples in those sections. So hopefully this uh, video helps in answering these two questions. If, 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 if anyone has um, any further questions, feel free to uh, email me or post it on the Canvas form. Good luck with these questions.